So next up, our speaker is Mike Hill. Uh, Mike is a multidisciplinary conceptual designer in the film, television, and game industries. He is co-founder of the Berlin-based Emmy Award-winning Character Design Studio. Mike has designed for Warner Brothers Blade Runner 2049, HBO's Game of Thrones, as well as for video games such as the Call of Duty series and Horizon Zero Dawn. He's also drinking. He's got a couple of beers lined up. He's got a beer in his hand. He's got a beer here. He's drinking alcohol. It's, it's, he's so rock and roll. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know if he's like maybe just a little bit nervous and these are kind of like pre-talk kind of nerve beers, or maybe he's just a massive piss head. We shall find out. Uh, will you please give a lovely warm round of applause for Mike Hill. Uh, thank you. Hey guys, um, I'll go with the rock and roll aspect, even though it's actually hair of the dog, very hungover, and a bit of Dutch courage, which is fitting, given where we are. Um, so, who, what, why? I had a great introduction there. Uh, my name's Mike. Uh, I've worked on games like Horizon Zero Dawn as a concept designer, um, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, where I was a level designer uh, and production designer, and films like Blade Runner, where I designed sets and I designed uh, props, and I basically helped the director visualize the world. Um, more recently, um, I've moved into story analysis, which is kind of an abstract thing, but I now help studios in the US analyze their stories and come up with strategies for, for series. Recently, working with David Fincher and Tim Miller on Love, Death and Robots, a new series that's going to come out on Netflix in March, as well as Denis Villeneuve's Dune adaptation of the Frank Herbert novel um, and Terminator. Um, so I kind of come from a background of being... Um, a visual designer, so illustration, um, architecture, uh, coming up with kind of visualizing science fiction worlds in general. Um, it's mainly technical design. I'm very much interested in systems-based design. Um, but that leads into things like illustration and creating marketing artworks, that kind of thing. And even though the output is um, creative in some respects, or artistic, I don't consider myself to be an artist. It's more of a problem-solving um, thing. So. That leads into things like level design, where it's about designing experiences for players um, and designing things like vehicles and hardware and technical things that need to work and function. Um, so I kind of think in systems-based thinking. I, I do animation as well and 3D modeling. But a couple of years ago, I decided that I wanted to apply that logical foundation to storytelling to see if there's an underlying story methodology that makes great stories great and crap stories crap. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is the power of metaphor, um, specifically metaphors as they apply to storytelling, and try and unpack some of the reasons that great stories reach us by using metaphors that are unconscious. Um, the main reason that I'm interested in this is because I really think that stories shape us, and we shape the world. So if you tell bad stories, then you get a bad world, because we bring these fictional worlds into existence when we tell each other stories. Um, one of the reasons, or an anecdote, that kind of illustrates just how much of an effect a story can have on how a person can shape themselves and therefore the world is, this is a book called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, or The Jewish Peril, and this was written years and years and years ago, um, and it's a story that stipulates that there's a, there was a Jewish conspiracy for world domination, um, and this was a piece of fiction that Hitler was extre extremely enamored with, and it formed his worldview, and it formed his understanding of how the world is organized, and the consequences of that are pretty significant but it was just a piece of trashy fiction. And if we tell trashy fiction, then we get a trashy world. So two guys that were really interested in how that world could come about, um, this guy on the left is called Joseph Campbell, and he's a cultural anthropologist, or somebody that studies cultures and studies myths and studies the stories that each culture tells themselves. And the guy on the right is Carl Jung, who I'm sure you guys are fairly familiar with, the founder of psychoanalysis. And these guys were both interested, they were contemporaries in how myths are an important component in shaping psychological processes. Um, and when we think of myth, I generally feel that there's a tendency that we think about guys in sandals or these antiquated stories from whoever knows how long ago. And we tend to think that they're kind of a superstitious fad that existed long ago, but we're all hyper-rational now and we don't need that stuff anymore. But the idea of myth is what is the, the basis for all of our movies today. Um, they're not superstition, they're metaphors that relate to our psychology. So what they are ultimately is a metaphorical story that helps convey moral and practical lessons. So 
Joseph Campbell, he studied all the myths from various cultures across the world, from Japan to Papua New Guinea to the US to Native Americans. And he was fascinated by getting rid of the idiosyncrasies that separate them and seeing what, un what was underlying all of them to see if there was a common bond. And over the course of many years, he studied all these myths and he came up with a system that distills all the mythologies from all the world into a very logical, structural piece of, um, well, yes, yeah, structural story, effectively. And he called it the monomyth. And the monomyth is possibly one of the most impressive um, discoveries of any cultural anthropologist. Um, and you've all seen the monomyth. If you've watched The Lion King, you've seen the monomyth in action. If you've watched Mad Max, you've seen the monomyth. If you've watched The Matrix, it's the monomyth. Lord of the Rings, aliens. These are all following the same structure, even though they seem on the surface relatively different. But I'm not going to talk about those ones today, but I'm going to try and unpack this, quite a complex um, subject. But I'm going to unpack it by using films that hopefully we've all seen. So we're going to unpack the monomyth as a structural aspect with Star Wars. And then we're going to break down the Jungian psychology by using examples of The Dark Knight and Jurassic Park. So if we start with Star Wars, I'm hoping that you guys have all seen Star Wars. Um, if you haven't, I'm not sure where you've been. Uh, so Star Wars was actually created by uh, George Lucas. And for those of you who aren't familiar with George Lucas's background, before he was a film director, he was actually a cultural anthropologist. So he studied mythology, and Joseph Campbell was his mentor. And he openly acknowledges that Star Wars, as a creative process, was driven by the monomyth structure. He actually read the book, Hero with a Thousand Faces, and then created this myth based upon that logical construction. So to understand, we're going to do a quick top-level view of what the monomyth is. Imagine a story is like a circle. And there are two thresholds, horizontal and vertical. The first threshold, when we go around it, the first threshold you cross is the vertical threshold. And on the top level, it's called the ordinary world. This is the world where the hero that's in the story is living within a known space that he can operate within. And then when he travels into the special world, it's everything that he doesn't know, where there's chaos and there's threat and there's the, the possibility of death. And on the horizontal axis, through the process of going into the unknown world, there is a death and a rebirth that leads to the old self being discarded and a new self being formed. So the idea of the monomyth on a fundamental level is that it's about psychological growth through challenging yourself to take on things that you are afraid of and you don't understand. So there's a simplified version of this. We're going to break it into 12 steps. And it's 12 steps that is a kind of synthesis of the hero's journey that was created by a guy called Christopher Vogler, who was a story analyst in the 80s in Hollywood. And he distilled the whole thing down into a memo so that Hollywood executives would understand it and therefore apply it. And he is one of the um, writing crew of The Lion King. So in the first step, using Star Wars as an example, we have the ordinary world. Now, in the ordinary world, we have Luke, who's this farm boy. He's reached a stage in life where he needs to consider going out into the world. But obviously, he's protected by some authority figures that care for him. And they're saying, no, you're not ready to go into the world. Stay on the farm. But he receives what's known as a call to adventure. This is a, a, a motif in the hero's journey. And the call to adventure, and keep in mind that everything that I'm saying here is a metaphor for psychological internal processes. The call to adventure is the moment when a whisper or a piece of intuition enters your mind and says, you need to go and travel beyond what you know. In the form of Star Wars, it's this brief, tiny whisper that comes from Princess Leia that says to Luke, or gives a hint that he needs to go and find Obi-Wan Kenobi. So Luke goes off, and he takes his first tentative steps into exploring the unknown world, and he goes and finds the mentor, which is called Meet the Mentor. This is where he looks for advice on how he should progress, given that he knows something needs to be discovered. So the mentor, obviously, is advising him that he needs to take those steps. He needs to move forward. And initially, of course, you're afraid. So that's known as the refusal of the call. So your hesitation and your anxiety stops you from pushing forward. But ultimately, as in real life, you cannot continue to anxiously wait for the new challenges, because eventually the real world will push you forward. And that's what happens in the monomyth. His parents or his auntie and uncle are destroyed by the empire, which means that he now has to make a move. He can't stay on the farm anymore. So he then crosses the threshold. This is the moment where he goes from the ordinary world into the special world. And the special world is where he suddenly realizes that there is a lot more scope beyond the farm. He discovers vices. He sees and meets what's known as tests, allies, and enemies, which is that he finds, uh, he gets an experience of the universe that says there's a lot more going on, and it's quite dangerous, and it's full of vices, and there are dangerous aliens, and there are people from across the universe. He then learns things along the way. Uh, by being trained up in order to take on a new challenge. 
And then there's the approach, and the approach in Star Wars is the Death Star, which everyone, I assume, knows what that is as an iconic symbol. And psychologically speaking, what the monomyth suggests this means is that it's going into the inner, inner parts of your psyche that you don't normally enter in order to acquire a new piece of experience about yourself. And in the form of Star Wars, it's Luke getting in contact with the feminine principle. So Princess Leia isn't a love interest, it's his sister, because psychologically speaking, it's about bonding with inner aspects of yourself that you haven't had access to before. Then there's the ordeal that in the process of acquiring this, this, uh, this challenge, you, you get put through a death and rebirth. So these guys get, through, get put into a, a pressure cabinet where Luke is dragged underwater by a tentacled monster, and then this motif of being attacked by a monster kind of tracks across all mythology. It's sometimes known as the, the belly of the whale, and other times it's known as the cave of the dragon. And the idea is that you're going in and facing the inner aspects of yourself that are aggressive, that are animalistic, which is why there's a motif of getting gold from the dragon, because facing up to the aspects of yourself that are scary gives you a reward. So the process of, of gaining this insight, you lose things along the way. So Obi-Wan Kenobi is killed, but Luke has integrated him, which is why from then on in, Obi-Wan is a voice inside of Luke's head, because the value of the, the wise mentor has been acquired, and while he's lost that, he's gained the reward of another aspect of himself. So this is a process of handing over one thing, picking up something else, and transforming through the process of experience. They then go on a road back, which is going back to the ordinary world, which is no, you know, removing yourself from the, the unknown. And then in the act of doing so, there's a resurrection. So the resurrection for Luke is that he now has achieved what he talked about in the beginning of the film, which is he wanted to be a pilot with the rebellion. So he's become a rebellion pilot, he's autonomous, he's self-responsible, he can look after himself. He then destroys the Death Star, which was the container of all of his repressed ideas. And then in the, the structure of the monomyth, he what's known as return with the elixir, which means that he now returns to the ordinary world, celebrated for having taken the risk and experienced chaos and coming back with a reward that benefits everyone. So the idea of this story is that it's a psychological metaphor of transformation. You start in one position, Luke, this farm boy, and then he ends as a rebellion pilot. So ultimately, what these stories or the monomyth structure is about is about having these ingredients that help you understand a causal chain of if you commit to yourself to something that terrifies you, it will give you rewards, but it will also be painful. So one thing that generally comes up when you talk about the idea that so many stories fall into one structure is that sounds completely nonsensical because you've all seen so many stories. How is the Matrix connected to Lord of the Rings? How is Lord of the Rings connected to the Lion King? But the best way to think about it is that everyone in this room is unique. Everyone has a unique personality, but we all share the same structure of the skull. We need the skull in order to have a face that gives us personal expression. If you remove that structure, what you get is something that doesn't communicate. The reason that this structure finds itself appearing across all mythology is because it's the natural structure in which we can communicate values of transformation. So to boil it down even further, so we've gone from a book to 12 steps, we're going to go to eight steps. This guy here is called Dan Harmon. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Rick and Morty. All of Rick and Morty's episodes are based upon the structure of the monomyth, and in order to even simplify it further, Dan Harmon reduced it to eight steps, which expresses why it's universal. You start in one position, you need something, you go, you search, you find, you take, you return, you've changed. The reason that this structure exists universally is because it's the fundamental, basic metaphysical formula that leads to all progress in life. It's unavoidable, you cannot do anything with progressing yourself forward without these steps. So the monomyth is a dramatization of these steps. Or in the words of Joseph Campbell, the monomyth is the idea of human life as a journey towards the ultimate goal of wholeness and self-realization. Now, self-realization is a Jungian term. Campbell was a massive uh, follower of Jung, and they were both fascinated by how these myths track on to psychoanalytic processes. So Carl Jung, who's the guy that came up with the term self-realization, or he would refer to it as the process of individuation, which means becoming an individual, he was fascinated by the same thing that we talked about in the beginning. He was obsessed with how someone like Hitler could come to be as an individual, but also how an entire country could line up and be in service of a guy who was clearly psychopathic. Like, how is that possible? Today, it seems like it's not possible, but it absolutely is because of the way that humans develop individually. If they don't develop individually, they can become in service of tyranny. So 
This is a picture from a Nazi rally in the 30s, and it's quite famous because there's one guy here who is individuated. This is a guy who is listening to this narrative of what the national conscience is saying they should do, and he refuses to raise his arm. And the reason he can do that is because he's self-realized. He's realized that he doesn't agree with the conscience, he can question the national conscience, and more than that, he's willing to be courageous enough to stand his ground. And that's the whole point of the monomyth, is to help everyone become strong enough to stand their ground in the face of what is clearly immoral. So Jung was fascinated by how we can move into this position of being these fractured individuals that will become tyrants like Hitler or people that follow Hitler and do his bidding. And he developed a system that breaks down the psyche and it works like this. You're born and you're born completely connected with the world. You're connected to mother, you're connected to father, you're protected. You have no sense of difference between you and everything else. The world is a perfect paradise. But then as you grow up, you have to individuate yourself and you have to integrate and you have to connect and network with other people in different groups. So you have to do things and sometimes you do things to please others. So you do the right thing and you get rewarded. So you then push those things that you're doing that you get rewards for, you push them forward because you've been validated and that goes into what's known as the persona. The persona is the way that you act in order to please others, in order to be validated and to be included in social groups. But the downside of the persona is that in order to satisfy the persona, you also have to repress certain things. So sometimes you do things that are natural, impulsive, things that are good for you as an individual, and you're punished. And a developing ego does not like to be punished. So in order to avoid punishment and avoid shame and avoid guilt, it presses and represses any impulses that are inside of it. And it pushes them down into what's known as the young in shadow, which is that your impulses don't disappear when you block them. They simply fester in the unconscious, unresolved and unacknowledged. So the reason that this happens is because we all relate to systems of authority because we want to be included, we want to be accepted as a group. So you initially develop personas to, to please the authority of school, to please your friends, to please teachers. You then go into college and you want to please new people, potential employers. You then go into the employment system and you need a persona for that. And then maybe you join the army. But the persona is based upon codes of conduct that you follow that you might think are your conscience, but that's not the case. In psychology, it's recognized that your conscience, the thing that you think defines your personality, is actually a faith in authorities. So sometimes you think that your personality is built upon your own cognition and your own decisions, but actually it's unconscious things that you learned at a very young age. In psychology, it's stated that our conscience is everything that was regularly demanded of us without reason during our childhood by persons who we respected or feared. So most of us are actually running on protocols that we didn't decide for ourselves. So this is often metaphorically represented, especially historically, as the little angel that says be good, that gives you the message of this is how you should behave. Then there's the little devil that is impulsive and just wants to do its own thing and it's saying do it, eat the chocolate go and do this vice that you're not supposed to do. And then there's us in the middle. And we don't know quite what to do with these competing, these competing inputs, which makes us unresolved, it makes us fractured, it makes us unhappy, it makes us stressed. Which is why the monomyth talks about the idea of continuously challenging those conscience codes in order to become so confident in your own ability that you don't feel pressured into doing things that you shouldn't do. So, I like etymology, which is, this slide shouldn't really be in here, but it's one of these facts that I love. The word angel comes from angelus, which is Latin for messenger, and that's, it's evidence of the fact that we, we don't really recognize it, but angels are messengers from an outside source. And devil comes from deviate. The devil is not a self-autonomous thing, it's a reaction to the message. So the devil just wants to do his own thing, and he's deviating from the code. And this is kind of important when we talk about Batman. So you have these two sides of yourself. We all relate to it. We know what it's like when we're presenting different personas in different groups. You don't talk to your grandma the same way you talk to mates down the pub. You need to constantly give a face to the people you're dealing with. And that's stressful, and it means that you're fractured. So with that in mind, I'm going to give a quick breakdown of the dark night and hopefully illuminate aspects of what is some of the most electric kind of drama that's been around in the film industry for like the last 15 years. Um, and I'm going to show you a quick clip now from Christopher Nolan who is one of the smartest guys in Hollywood. And he, he studied at Cambridge, studied um, mythology, and he also studied literature. And this is him discussing his awareness of what's actually operating on an un unconscious level. And in studying English literature and, and talking a lot about it, I started to become more at ease with the idea that filmmakers, storytellers, 
they grasp evocative symbols, they grasp resonant imagery. And the reason these things are evocative and resonant is that they do have other layers, subconscious layers uh, of resonance that the reader, or in the case of film, the, the film goer, can pick up on and interpret in their own way. And that, that is a valid uh, approach. And that was something I, in retrospect, I very much needed to, to learn and, and, uh, and get on board with. So Nolan and his brother Jonathan have created some of the most iconic and classic cultural entertainment of the last 20 years, including recently Westworld, which was created by um, Jonathan Nolan and his wife Lisa Joy. And these guys are operating on Jungian levels. They even openly reference Jungian concepts in their films. Um, they actually address it directly. And they're not hiding the fact that ultimately their films are based upon unconscious, subconscious uh, manipulation. So what these guys are doing is they're using Jungian psychology. Um, so let's take the idea that we've established of the little devil, which is your shadow that's saying do it, is impulsively wanting to do things. And then there's the little angel that says, no, 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 there's a moral code. We can't do that. It's bad. Well, in Batman, we have a developing ego, which is Bruce Wayne. He's a, a, a person that's trying to be the right person for himself and for the city of Gotham. And his super ego, which is the Freudian term for the code that our personas operate on, is Batman. That's a metaphorical representation of him trying to be the best person he can. But in doing so, he's repressing aspects of himself. And how do you metaphorically represent that in a story? Well, you have the repressed, animalistic, resentful id, which is the shadow. Now, one of the reasons that we're so captivated by the Joker, or Heath Ledger's Joker especially, I think nobody is unaffected by the Joker's performance in that film. And you could say it's because he's zany and he's wacky and because he acts really well, but that's not the case, because Jared Leto was zany and wacky in the latest Batman film, or the latest uh, Joker in iteration, and it didn't affect anyone. And the question is why? Well, it's because Nolan has written this character to specifically tap into aspects of your unconscious, and he's directly a voice of certain aspects in the same way that gods are in Greek mythology. In Greek mythology, you have the pantheon of the gods, you have Zeus discussing the nature of human beings with people in the clouds. We don't sign up to that anymore, but we do actually transition those things into superhero movies. So in this next clip, I'm just going to ask you to, to see the dialogue of the Joker and notice that this is a direct reference to these psychological principles of the Joker saying to Batman, your codes are too much, they're silly, they're arbitrary. To them, you're just a freak. Like me. They need you right now. But when they don't, they'll cast you out. Like a leper. You see, their morals, their code, it's a bad joke. And dropped at the first sign of trouble. They're only as good as the world allows them to be. I'll show you. When the chips are down, these, uh, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. The Joker is giving a voice to a lot of things that we feel that we don't have a voice for in ourselves. He's basically saying, these codes that you're following, doing the right thing, it's bullshit, it's arbitrary. Like, what about doing what you wanna do? And one of the ideas behind these interactions is that it's allowing the idea of psychological forces to be embodied and then to be given a voice and to be given expression. And that's why we tell stories, because they allow us to understand something that's already operating on an unconscious level. So what he's saying is, these codes that we're following, are they real? Like, are they, are, they the, are they actually worth it? So what Jung described is that when you don't acknowledge your inner animal, the impulsive aspects that you, you want to act upon and you constantly in inhibit yourself and you repress yourself, it festers into what's known as the beast within or the caged beast. And Nolan directly attacks this idea with the, the Dark Knight. And in this scene, we're going to see what happens when the Joker, the repressed idea of not being able to act the way he wants, is now put into a situation where he's watching authorities backpack each other for being amazing at what they're doing and promoting each other within social systems. What do we got? Nothing. No matches on prints, DNA, dental, clothing is custom, no labels. Nothing in his pockets but knives and lint. No name. No other alias. Go home, Gordon. The clown will keep till morning. Go get some rest. You're gonna need it. Tomorrow you take the big job. You don't have any say in the matter, Commissioner Gordon.
Now, we all know the feeling when you're in a system where you have to climb a ladder or you have to operate politically or when you have to do things to, to appease the group. But there's a part of you that's like, do I even want to do this? How many people have been in jobs where their inner self is saying, this is bullshit. Like, why, why am I trapping myself in this situation? And this is a dramatization of that feeling, which is why we relate to it. It's a bunch of authority figures all talking about promotions. And then inside this cage is a very resentful animal. And that's part of your psyche. So this idea of encaging this animalistic beast is just a metaphor that taps into something you feel on an unconscious level. And this resentment that he's showing is an aspect of that. And the idea is that it's a metaphor for how you feel when you don't access your own impulses. So the, the Joker is actually referred to as the agent of chaos. He's an archetypal force, which is that he's not an actual character. So when people talk about the Joker, quite often a big discussion is, what's his background? What's his history? And in the story, it's explicitly pointed out that every time he tells his backstory, it's different because he doesn't have an identity, because he is a metaphorical representation of a psychological force. He's not an actual narrative being. He's just a force. And in this scene, you're going to see him refer or talking to Harvey Dent and corrupting Harvey Dent's sense of morality by expressing how arbitrary our codes are again. You, you know what I noticed? Nobody panics when things go according to plan, even if the plan is horrifying. If tomorrow I tell the press that, like, a gangbanger will get shot, or a truckload of soldiers will be blowing up, nobody panics, because it's all part of the plan. But when I say that one little old mare will die, well, then everyone loses their minds. Introduce a little anarchy. Upset the established order, and everything becomes chaos. I'm an agent of chaos. So he's tapping into this idea of don't follow the rules. Please don't follow the rules, because as long as you follow the rules, there's an aspect of yourself that is repressed and gets frustrated. So the one thing that's interesting about the Joker that many people don't notice is that the Joker isn't a villain in the traditional sense, because he has no desire to kill Batman. All he wants is for Bruce Wayne to give up his code, which is to not kill anyone. And in this scene, you'll see that this is the archetypal devil, because what he's actually trying to do is goad Bruce Wayne to actually give up his codes. So notice here that he could kill him, but he doesn't, because he's not a villain, he's a psychological force. So the Joker is a response to the code. He's not an actual s being in himself. He's just this, this trapped thing, and he needs Batman to give up in order to be free, which is why he's asking him to break his rules. He wants to die. He wants to be put out of his misery so that he's free of this cage. So what he's saying is, do it. Break the code. Break the moral code. Um, so ultimately, like we talked about the shadow, we talked about the idea of us wearing masks every day. And what is it that the Joker explicitly wants in the Dark Knight? What is it that he tries to make happen in his actions? And this sums it up. And this is, once again, a metaphorical representation of Jungian psychology. <laughs> so you think Batman's made Gotham a better place? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Look at me. Look at me! See, this is how crazy Batman's made Gotham. If you want order in Gotham, Batman must take off his mask and turn himself in. Oh, and every day he doesn't, people will die. Starting tonight. I'm a man of my word. <laughs> so 
So Nolan is actively using the concept of take off the mask, take off this moral persona, and if you don't, I'm gonna start killing people. So it's a psychological principle. So we've got these ideas that have been around since time immemorial, the idea of the devil that represents chaos. The Joker is a manifestation of that. We have the idea of the angel. Well, we don't like dealing with angels in modern world, so we use the idea of a superhero that represents angelic moral codes. And then there's us in the middle, the developing ego that's trying to work out what's the best way to behave. So if you needed to represent metaphorically what happens in a story where the main character doesn't integrate his shadow and doesn't upgrade his persona, you show that metaphorically by having a representation of somebody that's split in half, that gave up on morality entirely and now flips a coin to decide what he should do with his life. These are all metaphors. So the, the three films of Batman Begins, and Nolan has expressly admitted this, that he saw the potential of Batman as being, an, Gotham being an allegory for psychological development, is that it's about three stages of life. Batman Begins is about the movement of a fearful child turning into a young adult. The Dark Knight is at the stage of midlife where you realize that you don't have control of everything and you need to accept the limitations of what you can do. And the third film, The Legend Ends, is retirement, which is why not only is his mask smashed and his mask removed, but he ends the film with bad knees and a bad back because it's a metaphorical representation of the process of individuation from youth all the way through to adulthood. So Nolan is tapping into these things because he's a smart motherfucker, and this allows us to really tap in to what we feel at various stages of our life. So these stories are utilizing psychological principles, and the more you tap into this journey of confronting chaos and confronting the unknown and confronting your own impulses, the more you understand yourself. And the idea is that you do it so many times that eventually you have no lack of awareness about your own self, about your own psyche, and you can be at peace with yourself. But it's difficult to go on these journeys, so we need to encourage each other to do it with these, these inspirational narratives. And if you don't, the inner impulsive animal turns into a festering beast. If you do, you can domesticate that beast and it can become part of you, and it can become a helpful companion. Because we are all divided, and that's a neurological fact. We are a series of modules that have evolved over millions of years. Some of them want completely selfish things, some of them want to be altruistic, and some of them want to be intellectual. And we're just trying to make them all work together. That's all we're trying to do. So the ordinary and special world, which was the, the, the terminology that, that uh, Joseph Campbell used for the, uh, the monomyth, is the same as saying it's the known and the unknown, which is the same as saying the persona and the shadow, because the persona is where the rules are laid out and you know it. And the shadow is the domain where you haven't actually tapped into certain things because you've been told not to. And ultimately, that comes down to what's known as control and chaos, the two most fundamental psychological archetypes. And I'm going to break them down now. We've seen them with the, in the case of Batman and the Joker. But I'm now going to try and explain this archetypal system by using the concept of Jurassic Park. Now, Jurassic Park, once again, if you guys haven't seen it, I have no idea where you've been. But so Jurassic Park is one of my favorite stories, and I've been obsessed with this for quite a long time because I'm fascinated by how a story can access so many different demographics and everyone likes it. It's bizarre and seemingly incomprehensible that a story can appeal to my grandma, my mum, my four-year-old niece, and my teenage like, nephew. Like, how is that possible? And the reason it does, it does this is because it taps into psychological ideas that are actually very explainable through the context of psychology. So I'm going to try and make it a bit more understandable. I want you to imagine that your unconscious is the cookie monster. And archetypes, which are very complex and very abstract, but I'm going to try and simplify them, are cookies. Now, if you give an audience archetypal ingredients, they will naturally eat it up because it means it's naturally important to them. So what is an archetype? Well, it's a set of, it's a complex of qualities that we need to, to have in ourselves in order to be functional. So one archetype, for example, is made up of three ingredients, which is being stern, being controlling, and being protective. In psychology, this is summarized as the father archetype. And it has nothing to do with gender. It's got nothing to do with any gender politics. It's simply a way of expressing the idea of protective and defensive. And then we have the attributes of feeding, nurturing, and soothing, and being affectionate and being compassionate. And this is summarized as the mother archetype. Now, these things have nothing to do with gender. They're to do with the qualities that a whole human being should develop. It doesn't matter where you're from or where you've been or where you're going, you need to have these sets to be whole. So four major archetypes that are in Jurassic Park are order, which is the same as Batman, but as, as you'll see, it will manifest differently in Jurassic Park. Chaos, which is the same as the Joker. Then there's the animus, which I'll explain in a second, and the anima. These are four fundamental archetypes. Now, 
the anima, or the animus, is that for females, in order to become whole, they have to integrate aspects that aren't naturally and culturally intuitive or naturally encouraged. So for example, for females, it's about establishing um, male, the male principle is what it's known in psychology. And for males, it's the same, it's the inverse. That if you're encouraged for your entire life to act in a certain way, then there's a whole side of yourself that you haven't discovered, you need to cultivate it. And depending on where you got dropped in society, you have a different set of things that you need to cultivate. So the reason that we need to cultivate those things is because you're never gonna be a good protective guardian figure to children if you only have one set of qualities. If you're stern and powerful, you're still weak because you're not affectionate. If you're affectionate and caring, but you're not strong and defensive, you're weak. So you need to have these attributes to be a good human being. So one of the important things when you think about a story is that what's happening on the surface is not what's happening under the surface. And the subtext of Jurassic Park, you might think it's about dinosaurs, but it's actually an allegory for the idea of becoming parents. So what's known in mythology is there's a thing called the inciting incident, which is the big question that actually defines the whole story, and it's usually completely connected to what's known as the herald. And that is the, the force that arrives to take the people that are asking the question on a journey that will give them an answer. And here is the question of Jurassic Park, and watch what happens the moment the question is asked, who arrives? Oh, kids. You want to have one of those? I don't want that kid, but a breed of child Dr. Grant could be intriguing. I mean, what's so wrong with kids? Oh, Ellie, look, they're noisy, they're messy, they're expensive. Cheap, cheap. They smell? They do not Some sm of them smell. Oh, Baby break. smell. So the moment the question is asked, you want one of those, this guy arrives from the heavens in a helicopter, and what is he going to offer them? He's going to offer them a journey to go and experience the creation of life itself on a magical mythical island where he's generating life. And the big question of the film is, you know, can you be responsible for life? Is it responsible to artificially create life? And that is a question that we archetypally ask when we're considering having children. So it's crossing threads. Subtext allows you to process a concept without conscious awareness, and that makes it more powerful because it operates emotionally and not intellectually. So in Jurassic Park, the four major archetypes of order, chaos, and then the anima and the animus are depicted metaphorically using things like colors and using things like character traits. In the case of Jurassic Park, we have God, we have the devil in terms of Malcolm, we have the anima in terms of, look at the color scheme, we have an all masculine blue with a slight inner touch of red, and then we have the inverse with the feminine aspect, which is that Ellie is gonna to have to develop her inner masculine by facing up to a raptor, and Alan's gonna to have to face up to children. So you think you see characters, your unconscious actually sees a set of cookies, and it likes cookies. So we had before the concept of the devil and the angel. Well, Jurassic Park uses the same fundamental archetypes. It just manifests with a slight tweak, and it's these idiosyncrasies that separate stories that actually have the same structure. So we have the devil, and we have God. We have the devil, and we have God. God is bringing life into the world under a lit halo, and around him stalks this devious figure that says you shouldn't have this much control, because it's a representation of these two forces that we're all trying to make sense of in our life, and they're especially important when you're thinking about having children. Do we have control of our lives? Are we in too much chaos? And you have to find a balance in order to bring that, that next state into fruition. So just to show you how actually blatant these concepts are in Jurassic Park, but you may not have noticed, here's a series of clips from the film where Spielberg is explicitly bringing up the association of God and the devil with Malcolm and John Hammond. Who in God's name do you think you are? John Hammond. I own an island. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. Mm -hmm. John doesn't subscribe to chaos, particularly when it has to say about his little science project. Oh, I'll swallow the end. I insist on being here. When they're born, they seem to trust me. I can tell instantly about people. It's a gift. I don't blame people for their mistakes, but I do ask that they pay for them. Thanks, Dad. I've been present for the birth of every little creature on this island. I'm do what you wouldn't do, Dr. Sadler, Dr. Grant. You've heard, of, you've heard of chaos theory? I bring scientists. You bring a rock star. Yes? 
I really hate that man. So Spielberg is tapping into these archetypal forces of the devil and God because we naturally and culturally understand the idea of extreme control being represented by this ominous figure, and we understand the idea of a deviant figure being this, this black leather rock star that is only talking about the values of chaos. Now, across the course of the story, we've got four archetypes, and all of them are going to transform. So the main thread is whether these people are ready to have kids. Ellie expresses that she is, but Alan is obviously not interested. He openly attacks children and possesses the qualities of an intellectual velociraptor. But over the course of the film, and if you look at Tim, who is a micro version of him, even in costume, he can't stand the kid. But across the course of the story, Alan then goes and confronts his shadow. And do you remember we talked about the motif of going into the cave to confront the dragon to get the gold? Well, if you don't want to use a dragon, you just make a T-Rex. It's a fucking dragon. And what's he going to do? He's going to tap into his instinctive qualities and become responsible for children by learning to be affectionate towards them through this challenge. Now, this motif happens again and again and again. It's about confronting the animal within, which is why so many films are based upon the idea of confronting this reptilian beast, because it's built into our hardwiring from evolution that we've been confronting snakes, we've been confronting lizards since time immemorial, since the, the being on the African plains. And there's neurological evidence that suggests we are hardwired, not just evidence, it's proven, that we recognize from default at birth spiders and snakes. Even if we've never seen them, it's hardwired into us on an archetypal level. So if you need to represent something that's terrifying, the, the, the unconscious naturally uses something that's relevant to our evolutionary upbringing. In this case, lizards or reptilian threats. So now ready for a tinfoil hat theory. Um, and I say that, but having kind of now been working in, in, with studios in the US for some time, I can tell you that this isn't a theory, this is an actual fact. The idea of Jurassic Park is a metaphor for the human psyche. This is the map of Isla Nublar, and they're going on a journey around the various parts of the brain. If you look at the, 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 the map, it's actually based upon a human brain. And if you overlay the human brain, the area where Alan goes to confront the lizard is actually the reptilian complex in neuroscience. And that's the origins of where your instinctive forces come from within the brain. He's going into a part of his psyche and confronting his instincts and mastering them in order to become a parent figure. So this is a metaphor. Now, you may think that who's going to get that? And that's true. But master storytellers are so in control of what they're doing, they get bored of just giving you completely obvious stuff. They start lacing in these little Easter eggs that are mainly for their own entertainment. Now, this story is written by Michael Crichton. Jurassic Park was developed by Michael Crichton, who also wrote Westworld. Westworld is also a giant analogy for the process of psychological development. It's about consciousness. So Alan then bonds with the children because he's left with no other choice but to go into the, the instinctive park where none of the normal rules of life apply. He then confronts all of these aspects of himself that he hasn't yet experienced. And Ellie simultaneously has to go and confront the Velociraptor. And Spielberg explicitly made the connection that Alan is a Velociraptor at the beginning because he uses his little his little thing to scare kids. She then masters that masculine threat, and by the time they've both developed, at the same time, we've got these two figures who initially are completely opposed because one thinks that control is absolutely possible and one thinks that chaos is universal, but they end up having to work together because the whole point of these stories is that being at any end of a spectrum when it comes to behavior is dramatically unhealthy for you. Being centric, which is what we're failing to do as a culture in general right now with left and right and gender politics, it completely defies the point of what makes people psychologically happy. So these stories express that working together, being balanced, acknowledging that being on any extreme is never going to work, this is what they're telling you subconsciously. So these guys then form into a metaphorical family. And then the very force that Alan has mastered is the very force that saves them from the velociraptors at the end, because it's a metaphor of integrating your shadow. So, they then become a unified family, and then the last scene of the film, which is the conclusion to this question at the very beginning, is you want one of those, and that's the last shot in the movie. The question is answered with, yes, I'm ready now to have kids. So the tagline for the film sums it up. Life will find a way, both biologically and socially. So the reason these films work is because they're working with archetypal transformations. This is why we're engaged by them, and this is why well, in fact, yeah, this is how your unconscious feels when you feed it uh, archetypal cookies. 
Hold the meal, cookie. It means whole lot to me. Cookie! Chocolate chip cookie means whole lot to me. Me not want to make this butter cookie feel bad. Kawabunga! This gingerbread cookie, very important too. Cookie! 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 Me love cookie! Now, the problem that I have, and one of the main motivations for why I went down this path of studying psychology and stories, and now I'm hoping I'm having an impact at the studio level, is that it defies belief for me that you can take something as perfect as Jurassic Park and then make this schlock. <laughs> and the reason that this is just such a pointless waste of human time is because it doesn't recognize any of the important aspects of what made the original film so good. It simply copies the superficial aspects that have no relevance to people's emotional well-being. And you can basically see what these people thought Jurassic World should be just by looking at the promotional video that came out before the film, and this is it. And see what you can acknowledge by what they think is important for the movie. In this Jurassic World, you will see more dinosaurs than you've ever seen in all the other Jurassic movies combined. And we're gonna see all the dinosaurs again that we all loved so much in the first movie. We're gonna have blue. We have the Mosasaurus. We have the T-Rex. We have a Baryonyx in this movie. We have a Carnotaurus. The Carnotaurus fights the Sinoceratops. We have a Stiggy Moloch. We just all love the Stiggy Moloch. There's dinosaurs everywhere. I wonder what they're focusing on. Now, the thing that they're doing is, through ignorance, to be fair, um, when, generally speaking, if you can hopefully explain this to somebody that's making these decisions, they generally get that they're focusing on the wrong thing, not always, unfortunately. But what they're actually doing is leveraging your emotional connection to the original film. And his, this is what's happening to your unconscious when a new Jurassic world is publicized. <laughs> Cookie jar! Oh boy, full of cookies, me going to eat cookie! Me happy just to think of eating cookies! Oh boy, oh boy! In this Jurassic world, you will see more dinosaurs than you've ever seen before. We have the Mosasaurus. We have the T-Rex. We have a Baryonyx in this movie, we have a Carnotaurus, we have a Stiggy Moloch. We just all love the Stiggy Moloch. The Carnotaurus fights the Sinoceratops. Oh! Well, we had so many dinosaurs in the same frame that we had to make the frame bigger. Kawabunga! Cookie jar empty! What the fans of the movie like is that we still have those real dinosaurs for the actors to interact with. No! Cookies! Oh, me so sad. You will see more dinosaurs than you've ever seen in all the other Jurassic movies combined. Me so sad. Wait. There's one cookie left. Here I am talking about dinosaurs again. Oh, no. Oh, now me did it. Dinosaurs everywhere. You know, this cookie eating, very emotionally draining. <laughs> so the, the issue that is widespread in the industry, across all industries, to be fair, whether it be design or video games or films, is that we have a natural tendency to simplify the world into quantitative because we value rational concepts more than we value emotional or abstract concepts. And that means that we miss the qualitative, and things like metaphors are, are completely qualitative, and they're very difficult to express. Um, but when you get them right, they're what makes all the difference. And these films, so the Batman sequels, the Star Wars sequels, the Jurassic World sequels, they're not tapping into any of the qualitative values, which is why we leave them feeling empty and a bit disillusioned. Um, and I mentioned Westworld earlier. I want to show you a clip now, which is a brilliant description that was written by um, Jonathan Nolan and, and Lisa Joy, which is them, through the, the, the form of theater, expressing their own frustration at the way these systems work when they greenlight movies and they greenlight entertainment. Um, and this is the clip. It's not about giving the guests what you think they want. But that's simple. The titillation, horror, 
manipulation. Their politics. The guests don't return for the obvious things we do, the garish things. They come back because of the subtleties, the details. They come back because they discover something they imagined no one had ever noticed before. Something they fall in love with. They're not looking for a story that tells them who they are. They already know who they are. They hear because they want a glimpse of who they could be. Billy! Let's go! The only thing your story tells me, Mr. Sizemore, is who you are. And I think that sums up in many ways what makes stories so powerful is that what they're meant to be is a description of who you could be. That's the, the main reason they exist. And Westworld is a piece of genius writing, at least season one. Season two I didn't fully understand, but um, the whole thing is a metaphor or an analogy for the process of psychodynamics, Freudian psychodynamics, which is why the main character is called Dr. Ford, which is a loose anagram of Dr. Freud. The entire thing is describing the process of individuation through the analogy of the maze. The maze is finding the core at the center of yourself by confronting all of these challenges within the game of Westworld. And even the character, Mr. Sizemore, is a metaphor for people that think that entertainment is about more size. So I mentioned at the beginning the concept of stories being important because you know a story like The Jewish Peril, which is just filled with, with absolute trite, can shape the world. And one on a more pragmatic level, I found out recently, um, when I was younger, my dad took me and my sister to see Hook, which is another Spielberg movie, and I'm not going to claim that it's a good movie, because it's, it's not, even by Spielberg's own admission, it's a very flawed movie, but it has a strong central moral core to it that is there to be a metaphor for the process of becoming a good father figure. And while we were watching this film with my dad, I found out two years ago that he said that he had a, a very conscious light switch moment while watching this film where he watched Robin Williams lose connection with his kids because he was appeasing his work too much and missing things, that he made the promise to himself that he would never skip any of our school sports events because that's what happens in the movie. And from then on, he never did. So this piece of Hollywood fiction changed the decision-making of a man in Southampton, England, and Spielberg's films have been seen by billions of people and it's not a huge stretch to say that he probably has had more influence over the positive qualities of a society than Gandhi. This guy is delivering straight into the minds of billions of people strong moral messages, and it's the failure of that moral messaging, which is why things are losing their way in the modern world. So some stories can lead to this, and some stories can lead to this. So I guess what I'm saying is I think it's really important to take these stories seriously. And in the words of Joseph Campbell, who spent his entire life studying stories to see what they meant and what they contribute, he said, the people who write these stories, and he was referring to Hollywood, do not have the sense of their responsibility. These stories are making and breaking lives. So I guess at the bottom of it, um, I hope that this has kind of introduced the idea that there's a lot more to a story than what meets the eye. Um, so thank you. Thank you.